so give me your first initial reaction. You got terminated last night. What, like, what was your initial reaction? Well, surprised, but not surprised. Uh, you know, based on the meeting they had last Thursday where they had the closed session uh, to uh, broadside me with these made-up allegations that they just come up with, you know, um, based on the tone they were taking, I, I could tell they were going to take some kind of action soon. So when I saw it last night come up, I really wasn't that surprised. This has been building up for several weeks anyway. So um, on the one hand, there's a little bit of shock, but really I wasn't surprised. I, I kind of saw that coming. So, you know, it is what it is. Tell me about these allegations, because obviously I've read over the allegations that Joe had, uh, the chairperson had released out there. Sure. So there are some pretty alarming allegations. What, what are these? Well, like, how do these come about? Yeah, you know, I would say alarmingly false. As I read through them, I almost laughed at the ridiculousness of them. Um, I did submit my response. I've got a 10-page response. I went through every single allegation point by point, uh, denying it and setting the record straight. So basically the deal with those is they came up with them only a couple of weeks ago. After my lawyer sent them a letter on February 15th telling them that they had absolutely no legal basis to terminate me, they decided uh, as a retaliatory measure to come up with these allegations uh, just recently. And they basically all come from one person and then a couple of commissioners as well. Uh, so they threw it together. Um, they are false. It's really quite shocking the manner in which it was done. As you know, last Thursday there was a closed session mm -hmm. in which they shared those with me for the very first time ever. An important point to point out is my uh, personnel file has no complaints like this at all. Absolutely nothing. Never have they sat down with me over the past year and said, you're doing this wrong, correct it. You're doing this wrong, correct it. Did not happen. It's just all of a sudden, uh, last Thursday, they came up with these uh, newly concocted allegations in a closed session. So I'm figuring it's a closed session, so they didn't want to make it public. But then the very next day, Sheriff Moss makes them public, which I thought was a very underhanded move and also very bad for them legally because it opens up several uh, affronts, uh, let's just say. So, uh, yeah, uh, they're quite shocking, quite false. Um, some of them, uh, it reads like they're written by a 70-year-old. It's just really bizarre. Now, you were attorney, your first attorney that came out in January threatened a lawsuit. Obviously, you don't have that attorney anymore. That's right. So what is the next steps for this? Yeah, so I picked a new attorney who is more specialized in employment law, which is a very good move I'm very happy with. He wrote an additional letter on February 15th, as you know, a nine-page letter detailing all the ways in which the board was about to violate my First Amendment rights as well as whistleblower protection rights and violate the terms of my contract, which they did last night. Uh, they terminated me with cause. However, there is no cause. The phrase cause is a legal term of art. There's a very specific definition that has to be met in order to qualify as cause. And I have by no means met that. But the board is not quite astute enough to realize that, so they don't think they realize the gravity of this mistake they made by doing that. Now, do you plan on seeking a lawsuit on this? I plan on seeking justice, absolutely, for sure. What goes to your mind? You've been at this job for a year. Mm -hmm. What goes to your mind now that they, they hired you yes. and now they fired you? You're right. I mean, it's very surreal. So you go back to January 3rd, 23. I was excited. I love the Ottawa Impact Commissioner as I love what they stood for. You know, they pushed back against all the lockdowns and things. I agreed with that. They wanted uh, limited governments, so transparency, good governance. I supported all of that. So I was very excited to come in and work with them. But it became clear after a few months uh, there's a difference between campaign rhetoric and actual governing. Actual governing is a science in and of itself, and it really takes a lot. And what I've learned, sadly, is that they do not know how to govern, and they do not care that they do not know how to govern. I do. I have years of experience working in the government. I was an assistant secretary in the federal government. I know how uh, to make policies. I know how to do an RFP to do procurements. I know how budgets are set. I know how to work within an organization. I know how to hire people. I know all these kind of things, and that's what they hired me to bring to the table, so I thought. But it turns out over time, as I would point out concerns or issues, they really fell on deaf ears. And so it really started to roll downhill uh, maybe March when I pointed out serious issues with the lawyers that they hired, who are personal friends of Joe Moss, family friends. And, you know, the Common Legal Group uh, does very good work in the area that they specialize in. Nothing against them whatsoever in that area. But when it comes to county law, known as municipal law, they simply don't have the background there. And it shows. So I wrote them an email that's out there in the public. Uh, and I said, we've got a problem. We're not getting answers from legal. They're saying they don't know how to answer these questions. And they're only there three days a week, even though we're paying them a fortune. So we've got a really serious problem. How do we deal with this? I got no response. 
So a few months later in July, I wrote a longer, detailed four-page letter uh, to the chairs of the uh, board committees, and I said, we have a serious problem. We need to do something with legal counsel, or else the county is not going to be able to operate without being able to get good legal opinions. And so I recommended keeping the commons for litigation, but getting new counsel, perhaps, for municipal law issues in the county. And that's when things really, really turned. One of the commissioners even said the devil got to me. <laughs> That was something that was said to me, and I was quite shocked to hear that. And so that's kind of what a lot of this began unfolding. And we all know about the $4 million, where Joe Moss has been saying they didn't offer $4 million, which is literally, factually, not true. The judge said clearly that the board in the closed session agreed to give the health officer $4 million. We know that for a fact. However, they got off on a technicality because the vote they took after the closed session uh, was not specific enough to uh, give her $4 million. So they agreed to it, but got off on a technicality. And Chair Moss really, really did not like the fact that I said, you agree to the $4 million and we can't do it. It's a horrible move for the taxpayers, horrible move for the county. We can't do this $4 million thing. Um, but he thought it was a, a lie, which it wasn't. So that caused friction. And if you remember at last Thursday's board meeting, he mentioned that. He said, Administrator Gibbs believed the news when they said that we offered $4 million. Well, yeah, because it was actually true. You did offer $4 million. And so we saw things kind of start unfolding in that manner. And it was very unfortunate because I had high hopes coming in. I love the people of Ottawa County. When I ran for Congress, I won Ottawa County by 11 points. So I'm really thankful that the people of Ottawa County supported me. And that's why Ottawa County has a special place in my heart. So I love the people. Everywhere I go, people come up to me and say thank you. Literally every day. My mom was visiting a couple weeks ago. And someone came up to me and said, hey, can I take a picture? Thank you for what you're doing. And she said, does that happen a lot? I'm like, yeah, mom, it happens every day. So I love the people of Ottawa County, and I'm sad that I won't be able to serve them in this role anymore. And they're the people who are losing the most. They're going to be losing kind of the last hope they have for good governance, because with the folks we've got in there now and the county commission, it's going to be a nightmare going forward. There's a lot to unpack with that answer. <laughs> Sorry. Um, come January 3rd, January 3rd, there was the overhaul. We, yes. have, we have talked about the overhaul here on Fox 17 quite a bit about the sure. fact that you came in, yep. Coleman Legal Group came in, they tried to appoint Nate Kelly as a health officer. Yes. That all on day one, moments after they were sworn in. So what happened before? Because I'm assuming you didn't just show up there. Right. So right. what happened before then? So I knew a lot of the Ottawa Impact uh, commissioners through my campaign and through their campaigns. Because a lot of events that were happening in the area in West Michigan, they would be at and I would be at as well. And so we kind of saw each other around all the time, and that's how I got to know them. So we were always having informal conversations and things like that uh, leading up to January 3rd. So I kind of knew them through both of our campaigning. Did they tell you we are going to hire you? Well, I mean, they did hire well, me on January 3rd, so they did, yeah, tell me that, yes. Mm -hmm. What went through your mind when they wanted you to be hired on as the county administrator? Um, I thought it was exciting. You know, I mean, I really thought it was an exciting opportunity. I said, this is right up my alley. I have the experience for this. You know, I've worked in government. I know how all this stuff works. I could really bring that experience to the table. I like what Auto Impact stands for. I like the things they're talking about. This could be pretty exciting. So I was actually excited when, they, uh, when we talked about that and when they brought me on. How early would you say those conversations started happening? Oh, I don't remember exactly. I have to go back and look. Okay. All right. Um, obviously, the, the big thing that kind of came out throughout the whole entire year was the health officer's budget. Sure, sure. Um, I know had Gretchen Cosby, the commissioner, had mentioned that she wanted a 5% reduction across the board, but then you mentioned the fact that that was not feasible for everything, right. considering the timing. Sure. But we still ended up going with a significant cut to the health officer's original plan. Sure. How did that come about? So uh, a little bit of backstory there. Back at last April, I sat with the board chairs and I actually offered them a plan for a vision, strategy, and direction for the county. I said, what I recommend to you guys with the budget season coming up is that you step back, take a comprehensive look at the county and at the departments, and come up with a strategy and a vision that will guide your budget-making process. Well, they refused. They just went right over their heads. In fact, I asked one commissioner, I said, let's develop a policy agenda. And she goes, what's a policy agenda? She literally didn't know what a policy agenda was. It was so weird. So they didn't do it the right way, which is that you look and you take a comprehensive look at the departments and develop your budget. Instead, kind of near the last minute, it comes down to me saying, cut out the department budget by this much. And so I'm like, okay, I'll follow that order. I'll do what you tell me, uh, Chair Moss and the commissioners. And so I worked to get the numbers lined up and uh, get them right. And so all kinds of back and forth. The county doesn't really have budgeting software, which is a big problem. So that makes things very fuzzy on all sides. That's why I did that. I got budgeting software, and they're implementing it right now, so I'm very proud of that accomplishment. 
added uh, many more sessions for the public to review the budget, which didn't exist before. So I really was able to accomplish quite a bit in the budget area, but still, it was pretty haphazard because it happened near the last minutes, and it was kind of random, and it was only applied to one department. But I do what I'm told. I work for the commissioners. They told me to do it, so I did that. When it came to, when it came to the commissioners and telling them what to, them telling you what to do, what commissioners told you what to do versus what commissioners told you what to do? Like, how did... Because obviously we've heard from other commissioners that they have no say whatsoever. So sure. how often were you hearing comments from one side of the aisle versus the other side of the aisle? Most of my interactions were with the chair and vice chair, uh, so Joe and Sylvia. I also had interactions with the chairs of the committees, Allison, Gretchen, uh, Lucy, Raj, because they were the committee chairs. So those are the ones that I had the most contact with. And Joe uh, also had the most contact with them as well, with the Ottawa Impact Commissioners. And um, I don't know the details about his interactions with the non-OI commissioners, but I don't think it was very robust. Um, I sometimes would communicate with Doug Zostra uh, occasionally, but not as much. So my interactions are mostly with the chair and the vice chair, and then also sometimes the, uh, the board chairs. But even that became a problem because they took that away from me. We had a weekly call. Uh, where I would talk to them and have open communication, discuss issues, discuss policies. They said, you can't do that anymore. And this is after I brought up my concerns about the legal issue in which I was told the devil got to me after that meeting. And so they began cutting back my communication to the point where by the end of last year, I was just very isolated uh, at, at all talking to any of the commissioners. So um, it was really uh, uh, quite a journey. But yeah, most of my, my communications were with the chair and vice chair and the, and the committee chairs. All right, so one communication that obviously sticks out to me the most is the $2.5 million general fund contribution sure. that Joe had pre presented during the, one of the financial committees. Sure. Um, obviously, it, that came up as a topic during the public hearing, sure. removal hearing for Adeline Hambly. Sure. So tell me a little bit about that $2.5 million contribution uh, discussion. Yeah, so Joe said, um, you know, let's try to see if we can make that $2.5 million. I took that, I said, okay, let's make this work. And so uh, between the finance department and between uh, the health officer and myself, we kind of got those numbers lined up to make that work. Um, you know, this is an issue that I think was fraught with, uh, with issues on all sides. I do think the health officer is going to the media with some things that were curveballs and not quite true. Uh, so everything I said during that hearing was correct in terms of how those, I would call it maybe a little bit of shenanigans, did happen from the health department side. Also, the manner in which it was done by the board was a bit haphazard, was a bit last minute, and it could have been done in a much more orderly fashion if it had been done earlier. And combined with the fact that, as I said earlier, the county has not had budgeting software. It's done by Excel spreadsheets and, the, and by very, very old, difficult to use financial software that we have. That makes this whole process even more difficult. You have three people with three different Excel spreadsheets looking at stuff. It's really, it was quite something. So there's a lot of different issues, issues that converge to make that a, a bit of a hairy process. Well, uh, so go back to that $2.5 million contribution. Sure. Um, how did you think that was going to impact the health department? Uh, when I looked at the numbers, I thought it would be possible for them to do it. Um, but, uh, you know, one of the tricky things here is what is a mandatory program and what is not a mandatory program in terms of state requirements. And then if the state requires a program, how many staff is it required to have in order to be a mandatory program? A lot of those answers are very fuzzy. And the county has not really looked at this kind of stuff before. It's kind of been on business as usual every year. And uh, the previous uh, commissioners have not necessarily asked these kind of questions or looked at what it would mean to cut something and what does it mean to keep a mandatory program at its required levels. So we were kind of in new territory in terms of asking those questions. I think those are good questions to ask and good things to go through. But again, maybe not in a haphazard manner in which it happened. So based on my analysis, I thought the $2.5 million was doable. The mandatory programs could be kept at a level that uh, satisfies legal requirements and we can make some adjustments to the non-mandatory programs. So that was my thinking at the time. But obviously we learned that they couldn't function at 2.5. Uh, I think we could. I mean, the big flashpoint was the uh, Ottawa Food Program, which I believe they do have the ability to fund that program many different ways. One, through within the health department, through funding that they already have, also through volunteers. The health department, uh, the Ottawa Food position was an individual who would basically coordinate with a huge number of nonprofit groups to keep them moving in the program. So that position could have been gone to a volunteer position, or the nonprofit groups could have picked up that position. There's many ways they could have kept that going forward without any cuts whatsoever. So I do think there's a bit of gamesmanship happening there. But um, yeah, I do believe that the 2.5 million general fund contribution was doable. But you know, with so much going on on all sides, it just made it much more complicated. Uh, obviously, we learned that Title 10 was definitely going to be impacted, Title 10 being the uh, Planned Parenthood possibly stepping in here. 
So obviously that cut was going to impact the funding for the Ottawa County, correct? Uh, I never had the ability to get to the bottom of that because there was some grandstanding on that and it was hard to see what was fact and what was fiction. And I do think that certain commissioners are using that as a talking point as well to attack the other commissioners. So it was a very fuzzy situation, all kinds of information coming in from different sides. But um, the Title 10 is another program where it's not exactly clear what the minimum requirement is. The state will tell you that you have to have a, at a certain maybe funding level, for example, but it doesn't tell you necessarily how many employees you have to have in order to administer the program. Or it may tell you how many people you have to see in that program, but it won't tell you how many employees you have to have in order to see that many people. So a lot of what is quote unquote required or not is a little bit fuzzy and the state should do a better job at cleaning that up more, I believe. Gotcha. Uh, coming to the discussion when it comes to this public hearing, obviously I was there both sure. three, how many, how many days I was there, sure. but obviously the two days I was there mm -hmm. uh, when it came to testimony from people. You had mentioned um, multiple times during that hearing, I don't remember, I don't recall. Yes. So explain the, like how that all those answers came about because it was a lot of those answers yeah and those are accurate answers because if you remember that lawyer was asking me very detailed questions about emails i had sent several months ago which obviously without being able to look at my emails and pull those up i have no way to be able to answer that so the correct factually accurate answer is i don't know or i don't remember because i couldn't remember that she would ask me like you had a phone call four months ago on this date what did you say on the phone call i'm like i don't remember exactly i can tell you what it was about but i can't tell you the exact phraseology that she was asking me so the way that it was done is there was these very, very specific questions about emails and conversations that I just didn't know. If I had my computer in front of me and I could look stuff up, I couldn't be able to get some answers. But on the spot like that, without knowing what was going to be asked, there's no way I could be able to answer those. So, yeah. Okay, sounds good. Um, obviously, a big uh, topic of discussion right now. They had discussed um, uh, during the... Um, uh, is it paid paid leave? When I saw the letter, they talked about the Kimball case. How they sure sure. Apparently, the corporate counsel offered your job up for that. Sure. Tell me what you can about this Kimball case. Yeah, it's an absurd case. So basically, they're accusing me of age discrimination because I hired a candidate that was younger than the older candidate. But the actual facts of the matter are the candidate I hired did better in his interview. Uh, I made all the interviewees do a PowerPoint presentation. He did better in his PowerPoint presentation. I made them do a writing assignment. He did better in his writing assignments. And I also went based on recommendations. He had better recommendations. Also, he had more experience working in state and local government. The other candidate had zero experience working in state and local government. So those are the reasons that I hired him. In order to prove an age discrimination, whatever kind of discrimination claim, you have to prove that that issue, in this case age, was the only reason that you picked that person over the other person. But in my case, all the reasons I just mentioned are the reason I picked him. Therefore, this case is total garbage. If you talk to an employment lawyer about this complaint and you show them the complaint against the county and let them read it from front to back, they'll tell you it's an absurd case. There have been cases that are actually real um, age discrimination, but they still have not been accepted by the judges. This is not, and there's no way any serious judge would look at it. So this is nothing case. But again, this brings back a point I mentioned earlier. The Coleman's don't have any expertise whatsoever in this kind of stuff. As good as Dave Coleman is in other issues like defending a shop that got shut down during COVID, great. But this kind of stuff, they don't have any experience in, so they don't know how to analyze it. If you talk to a real employment litigator, which is the kind of person you need for this, um, they will tell you it's a garbage case. But at board, they love the Coleman's because they're personal friends with them going back years. They don't even think to get actual real good lawyers who specialize in this to defend the county because they're friends with the Coleman's. And this is a disaster for the taxpayers. Uh, going back to uh, the Kimball case, uh, I, we had FOIA'd for the emails that Marcy Verbeek had sent out to sure. the Human Resources sure. Director for Ottawa County, and it was blacked out. Okay. Um, but we just recently got a copy of the unredacted email and did say, quote, you wanted to be able to boss him around. What, what do you have to say to that? I don't remember exactly. Um, I don't remember what kind of banter I was engaging in uh, facetiously or not uh, through that conversation. But the, the HR email, um, you know, allegation that I was engaging in discriminatory behavior is false. You know, it's absolutely not true. So it's among several false statements that were made regarding this. What could, obviously you've been, you've been at now at the job for more than a year. What would you tell yourself a year ago? <laughs> you know, I don't know if I would have been able to know what I know now a year ago, but if I could tell myself, I would say uh, maybe, I don't know. I don't know if I'd say don't do it. I wanted to do it for the people. As I said, I love the people of the county. When I ran in my election, I got the biggest support from Ottawa County, so I love the people. That's why I wanted to do this. Um, I don't know, I guess I would tell myself, uh, you know, be careful with the lawyers, you know, uh, that they brought in, uh, which ended up causing huge issues. Uh, I don't know. It's, it's hard to say. That's a very good question. I have to think about that a little bit more. 
<laughs> what would you, um, so going back, is there anything that you would change? Mm, I don't know. I mean, I think uh, given the circumstances, I did the best I could and made the best decisions I could for the time. Um, you know, uh, my relationships with a couple of commissioners weren't well, but that I don't think was on me. I mean, I tried to, to reach out and establish rapport, but some people have a political agenda, so they're not interested in acting in good faith. Um, you know, I think that I did the best I could and made the right decisions for the time. Do you think that they're doing anything illegal? Hmm. I mean, the manner in which my termination was hired is illegal. I, I believe there's no question about that. Again, I mentioned they terminated me with cause, but there's no cause. Cause is not just something you imagine in your head. That's what they believe. They think if they don't like you, then it's cause. That's literally the extent of their reasoning. It's hilarious and horrific. Cause is a specific legal term that you have to meet the definition of, which I have not. So that is illegal. Secondly, um, there's First Amendment violations. When I spoke up about the efficiencies with the lawyers, and both in March and July, as well as in private conversations since then, um, those are, that's protected First Amendment speech because it's for the public interest. So they're punishing me for doing that. So that's a violation of my First Amendment rights. And that is even bringing into account whistleblower protection violations as well. So I believe that in regards to my termination and the way they've treated me, there have absolutely been legal violations. And there may be other things out there as well. For example, I don't know for sure, but someone said that, you know, one of the commissioners is being paid as an employee of another commissioner. Huh, interesting. Uh, is that a conflict of interest? Um, I wouldn't be surprised on a bit of those kind of things are going on, uh, uh, you know, based on what I've seen. Again, there's no coherency, no strategy, no vision, direction. It's based purely on mostly two things, impulse and vindictiveness. Those are the two things that the current board rule is based on. There's no forethought involved. Uh, and it's quite stunning to watch. And when people operate in that manner and they don't think ahead and they don't have lawyers who know what they're doing, it sets them up for all kinds of stuff. I will predict there will be way more lawsuits uh, between now and when they may get voted out in November uh, based on the way they operate. So who knows? They, there could be some legal stuff. I don't know for sure, but I wouldn't be surprised if there was. Obviously, we saw a, a big tension between the board, you, and uh, the health director, or health officer, Adeline Hambly. Sure. What, what did you, what, what's, your, what's your thoughts about Hambly as a health officer? You know, in the absence of all the drama caused by the Board of Commissioners, I could have gotten along with Addie. I mean, I get along with anybody. I get along with people fine. So um, they wanted to take action because of what happened during COVID, and I understand that. I think they're going to be a smarter way to do that than what they try to do. And, you know, getting rid of her, Addie, the health officer, was one of their top campaign promises. That's why when they came in day one, they tried to do it. I'll never forget the first couple of weeks I was the administrator, I was talking to Chair Moss on the phone. I said, are you sure you can just fire the health officer like that? There's a law, Michigan Code of Law 46.11N. It says health officer has different procedures to terminate than other employees. You got to check this and make sure it's right. Oh, it's fine. No problem. No problem. Well, it turned out to be a very, very big problem, which they learned the hard way. They spent maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars, at least maybe upwards of $200,000 in legal fees trying to get rid of the health officer only to decide last Monday to keep her on. $200,000 wasted down the drain, campaign promise down the drain, all the people that believed in them to make a difference down the drain, only to keep her on. And it's worse than that. They had kept her on with binding arbitration. That means they're not going to be able to effectively manage because they have to go to arbitration every time there's an issue. This is so bad from a management standpoint. It's horrifically bad. But they don't understand that. They don't know anything about the day-to-day -day operations of the county. Um, they don't listen to anybody that tries to tell them what the county is like on a day-to-day -day basis, what it means to govern a department. Um, they really don't know how the government works, and they don't care that they don't know how the government works. And so I don't know that they really comprehend uh, the difficulty they're putting themselves in. Um, I did look up. I did. I did. I have filed quite a bit of FOIAs that yeah. I found out through the Ottawa County Insurance Authority. The Coleman Legal Group has billed $157,000 wow. just to handle Hambly's lawsuit alone. Um, sure. Going, uh, going on to talking about your discussions with Chairman Moss, um, there is a conversation that came up during the public removal hearing that Howard had asked, Hambly's attorney had asked, about uh, to Waterman, your deputy, uh, your former deputy county administrator. Mm -hmm. um, he said he would, there were comments that you would make that you might find yourself at the bottom of the <laughs> river. So it clarified, did you have a concern for your own safety while you were there? I would say that I did not have a concern for my physical safety, no. Um, I may have made that comment uh, half facetiously. I was talking about my job security, and it turns out I was right, by the way, <laughs> um, if, if I recall correctly uh, uh, that statement, I might end up at the bottom of a river. Yeah.
<laughs> do you, when it comes back to um, the deputy county administrator, obviously Waterman, um, mm -hmm. Epperson, they were both your hires. Mm -hmm. um, your attorney email uh, follow-up to those complaints or those allegations brought up against you by Moss that was shared online. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, Moss's email did not explain that they were complaints against from Waterman and Epperson in but your email you mean Wetmore and Epperson sorry thank you <laughs> thank you uh, Wetmore and Epperson um, so it, those complaints that were filed by uh, Moss were those the two can those two current employees that you yes yeah, so I believe that they are almost entirely from Epperson and then they were interspersed with uh, various com uh, weird complaints from the board members. So these are pretty much all from one person. My personnel file has nothing like this on there. These came up only two weeks ago. I've never had a performance review. So it's not like there was an issue uh, with me. Even Bonham, I tried to come at me and file a complaint, and the HR department threw it out because it was total garbage. And so there's nothing on my file. There's no complaints. They just came up with this literally a couple weeks ago, whatever they could, throwing stuff out the wall to see if it sticks. And they basically came just from one person, disgruntled employee. But that comes from people you hired. So do you? That's true. Yes. Yes. Do you regret those decisions now? I mean, now if I knew what I knew uh, now back then, I probably would have made a different decision. But this happens. You know, working in the Trump administration, we hired many people that turned out to be very bad news and turned to be, out to be backstabbers. You do the best you can. You check references. You interview the person. But sometimes it just doesn't work out. So, you know, it's one of those unfortunate situations. Who referenced Epperson to you? Um, I think. Uh, uh, a friend of one of the commissioners who works with him recommended him, okay. and I, I value that recommendation. I think some uh, one of his former uh, people that I used to work with at his previous job recommended him, so I I decided to trust that and, and went with it. But you know, it turns out to be a very unfortunate decision. I know we've had a long conversation. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to add in? Um, you know, I think people just got to keep an eye on what's going on with these commissioners because. They don't rule um, based on a systematic way of looking at things and having a vision and strategy and direction. It's all based on impulse and, again, vindictiveness, which is a really, really dangerous combination. Um, and when you don't have good lawyers to advise you on what to do and you have those two, those kind of traits, the way you're leading, it's a horrifically dangerous combination. So my heart goes out to the people of Ottawa County who are going to suffer the most by not really having any competency in there. Um, between them, they don't really understand how the government works, the commissioners I'm talking about. They don't care, they don't understand, and it's, a, it's like a cowboy type agenda. It's a very bizarre thing to observe. I've never seen anything like it. So I'm genuinely concerned for the people of the county and for the fiscal state of the county um, with the current state of things. Obviously, I've tried to, sorry, one last question. I've sure. tried to reach out to you multiple times. And like, there were times where I was like, John, Mr. Sure. Gibbs. <laughs> so explain to me why didn't you ever come forward and talk to us and explain a little bit about what's going on with the county. Yeah, you know, um, I would have loved to reach out to you, and I kind of felt bad that I was not able to do that. But, you know, as county administrator, I didn't feel it was my proper role to talk to the media a lot. I felt that was more the role of the Board of Commissioners. Um, now, they, I think, very unwisely decided not to talk to the media. Instead, they started their own blog. I forgot what it's called. It's quite hilarious. And it gets probably about three views a day total. Um, and they're not really getting their word out through this blog at all that they started. Um, I told them, sit down and talk to Matt, talk to the media, talk to uh, WZZM, talk to whoever it is. You guys got to talk to the media to get your story out there. They just didn't want to. There's a very conspiratorial type of thinking that uh, you're part of some plot to get him, out, go out and get him no matter what. And I tried to tell them, no, they just want a story. Sit down and talk to folks, but they wouldn't do it. So I really think that the commissioners do have a role to talk to the media and keep the public updated on what's going on. As the administrator who works for them, I didn't feel it was necessarily my place to speak for them to the media in that sense. So that's why I was kind of reticent in that sense. But now that things have changed, I'm very happy to talk to people. And I do think it's really important that the truth get out. And that's what I'm doing. I think it's important that people know what's going on. I work with the Board of Commissioners more than almost anybody. I'm acquainted with them and how they operate more than almost anybody by virtue of the fact of working with them on a nearly daily basis for the past year. So I just want people to know what it's like and um, what the governance of the county is like because people need to know that. And it's pretty terrifying. But, yeah, that's why I'm not, I was not able to talk to the media while I was in there as administrator. But now things are different, so I'm very happy to get the truth out there. The fact is, uh, Commissioner Doug Zalstra, obviously, mm -hmm. always pr try to bring up his own motions that were sure, sure. that the board seemed to shut down. Mm -hmm. um, he wanted to keep you. What, yeah. what took you? Did that take you back a little bit, trying to understand a little bit about that? Um, you know, it was quite interesting to see. I think that Commissioner Zalstra um, has a little bit more experience in life and experience with government than many of the other commissioners, and I think he correctly understands the huge. 
amount of liability, legal liability they've placed themselves in by what they've done. I think he understands that. So I think he was telling them, you better slow down and get some answers and figure out how we can handle this in an amicable way. I don't want to have a lawsuit. I don't want to do that. I don't want to go to litigation. I'd rather have a peaceful settlement. And that's what I offered the board. I said, let's do this amicably. Let's do this peacefully. Um, but they refused to do that. So now it's turned to what it is now, which I didn't want. But there will be justice now because of what they've done. I think Doug Zauser was at least astute enough, even though I don't agree with him politically, he was at least astute enough to see um, these commissioners are walking the county into a disaster. That, and, you know, unfortunately, they overrode him, and uh, the county may pay a price for that because of it. But, yeah, I mean, I think um, I, there's a, maybe he's bringing his experience, dealing with government and things, to bear and uh, trying to get them to be a little bit level-headed in this particular case. One more time, sorry. Uh, okay. so, sorry, uh, one more time. Sure. Oh, I was just saying that maybe Commissioner Zylstra was leveraging his uh, experience in government and helping them to be, at least try to think a bit more level-headed. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess he didn't have any success in uh, doing that, sadly. Is there, any commission is there anything you would like to say to the commissioners? Um, you know, at this point, uh, I think they've made their bed with the decision they made last night. And, um, you know, I, I will tell them I pray for them. You know, I prayed for them today, and I will continue to do that. Uh, and, uh, but yeah, remember the people of the county, you know, and it's not all about you, and uh, it's not all about vindictiveness, and try to have a plan for something for a change. Thank you for your time, John. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate it. Thank you.